Andrea Koppel, host of the Time for Coffee podcast, where you get firsthand career advice into the jobs and industries that interest you the most. And before we start today's show, I have a quick favor to ask you. If you haven't already, I'd be incredibly grateful if you give us a rating and a review on iTunes. And if you're like me, you need to do it now because you'll forget later and because it's the best way to help others who may be in search of career advice to find this free resource. So press pause if you haven't done it and do it right now. I'll wait. Thanks so much and enjoy today's show. Hey there, Java Junkies. Welcome back to another episode of t for c If you're interested in in pop culture, and you're wondering if it's possible to make a career out of it, then this is the episode for you. Because my friends, the answer is yes. In fact, my next guest describes himself as a pop culture archaeologist and is the author of 75 books. But before I introduce you to the immensely talented and gifted writer and public speaker, Mark Tyler Nobleman, I want to make sure you've signed up for the Java Junkies Journal. That's time for Coffee's weekly newsletter that comes out on Mondays and gives you an exclusive look into the episodes and the professionals we're going to be featuring that week. And it is super easy to do. Just head over to the Time for Coffee website at time, the number four, coffee.org. And the sign up box is right there on the home page. Now, my Batman-loving baristas, and I'll explain more in a minute, please grab your mug and take a chug of your favorite caffeinated beverage, because it's time for another caffeinated career conversation. And my guest is Mark Tyler Nobleman, a pop culture archaeologist and author of 75 books for kids and young adults, including Bill the Boy Wonder, the secret co-creator of Batman, which literally changed history, inspiring the unprecedented feature documentary Batman and Bill, which you can stream right now on Hulu and a TED Talk. Some of Mark's other books include Boys of Steel, the creators of Superman, which made the front page of USA Today, 30 Minutes Over Oregon, a Japanese pilot's World War II story, The Chupacabra Ate the Candelabra, or the Candelabra, Brave Like My Brother, and Fairy Spell, How Two Girls Convince the World That Fairies Are Real. That is the true story, by the way, of British cousins who fooled the world for more than 60 years with a remarkable hoax, photographs of real fairies. Mark also blogs about adventures in publishing at his blog, Noble Mania, and he's been invited to speak at schools from Thailand to Tanzania. And my son and I went to hear him speak in person at our community library. And I am being 100% sincere. You are in for a sit on the edge of your chair tour de force experience if you ever get that opportunity. Take it. Mark, welcome to Time for Coffee. Are you caffeinated and ready to go? I am ready to go. And thank you for that very generous introduction. You've done your research. I've done some of my research, not nearly as much as you have for some of your books. Oh, my goodness. But I have to ask you, Mark, are you caffeinated with coffee or tea or some other kind of beverage? Well, full disclosure, I don't drink coffee. I hope that's not disqualifying me automatically, but I am fit and ready to go and I'm fit in other ways besides coffee. So, okay. Well, look, I'm going to make an exception. I think you're caffeinated on life and on pop culture. Yes, you could say that. Okay, great. Well, I am so excited to speak with you today, Mark, and introduce T4C listeners to a career path, frankly, that I didn't know it existed. Do you know if pop culture archaeology is something that's actually being taught in universities today? Well, probably not under that term because I put it together for myself and probably others have as well, actually. But I do know that pop culture is becoming more 
of a reputable topic to study. I know there were college courses on Star Wars and on Harry Potter and on Batman. So pop culture topics are in the classroom. It might not be a, a formalized concentration, but certainly these days, I think a lot of universities are open to students creating their own concentration. And that could be what you choose. I love it. And by the way, if you want to learn more about what Mark does as a pop culture archaeologist and how he built his incredible career, check out the show notes for this episode to see if Mark's main time for coffee interview has already dropped. Okay, Mark, let us dive into our 10 espresso shots. The first question being, what entry-level jobs are available to young people who want to break into pop culture archaeology? Certainly anything involving writing or marketing would help you. And with the internet being a resource available to many of us, I mean, that didn't exist when I was starting out doing this. But anyone who starts his own or her own blog or podcast has a chance of carving out some territory in that world for yourself. At that point, it wouldn't be a paid gig, most likely, unless you're really savvy at getting advertising. But you can make a name for yourself, you know, long before you even graduate from college with whatever interest you have by just, you know, creating an online platform. Fantastic. And what do you think is a useful hard and soft skill or skills, Mark, that you have looked for over the years in the young people that you hire? And I know that you're a writer full time, but I'm sure that you've had to hire, whether it be copy editors or researchers or things along those lines. Well, actually, I'm a lone wolf. I've never hired anyone for anything. But if I were to hire someone, I would certainly look for someone who is serious about work, attentive to detail. And it would be important to me that that person is well read, not simply not a screen based person, but someone who it does pay attention to the world around him or her. And on a personal note, I just I would appreciate working with someone who has a good sense of humor. But that's just me. Okay, me too. (laughs) I love that. What about someone's major? Is it a deciding factor to get into this profession? In other words, If they haven't studied archaeology, if they haven't studied sociology or writing or anything of that nature, is it a deal breaker? Well, I mean, the nice thing about coming up with your own title and focus is that you can come from any direction. This term, this concept was not on my mind in college. It just ended up being something that made sense to me later on. I was already interested in pop culture and in history and in untold stories, but I didn't combine it into this concept of pop culture, archaeology until several years after college. So you can study anything and end up here. Nowadays, there's just so much more place on the individual's grit and persistence that you you can go in really in any direction that you want, regardless of what you studied. So I, I don't want to say that your concentration in your major doesn't matter. It does, but it doesn't limit you either. I second that as a chief Java junkie in my title. You know, you can make whatever you want out of your life and your career path. What about a grad school degree, Mark? And clearly you have launched a very successful career without one. But do you think it might be necessary for someone to get one? And if so, what do you think would be the most useful ones to have? Well, as you said, I don't have that degree myself, so I can't speak to it too deeply, but I certainly think if anyone feels that that is right for him or herself, then they should pursue that. For what I'm doing, certainly a, a degree in creative writing or in history would be helpful. But as you said, I didn't get that degree and I did this anyway. So there's a lot of self-education involved, with not just with this, but with any profession. You know, I learned on the job. And I, I had a very firm base from college, writing intensive background and also research. So it wasn't a graduate degree, but it was really a good foundation. But again, a graduate degree most likely will only help if that's what someone feels comfortable with. Yeah. We should let our listeners know that you majored in American studies and had a concentration in film when you were in school, but presumably you did a lot of writing as an American studies major. Yes, it was a writing intensive major and a lot of history as well. So it sounds a little bit vague. I'm sure my parents thought that when I told them I was 
going to major in that, but they never said a word that I can remember. Because again, it's all what you do with it. It's less about the boxes that you check, but rather, you know, the type of person that you are, again, what you do with that personality of yours and that determination. So American studies doesn't have a clear path. It isn't like biology is is most likely pre-med. It's an open-ended major. And a lot of people that I studied with went on to be lawyers and some are in marketing and some are executives at companies. So there's just a lot of direction you can go with that. And I just took a more creative path. That was what was right for me. I have landed on a way of describing the way I think that young people should think about their majors. And rather than thinking about it as a tiny house that they're going to be stuck living in for the rest of their lives, to think of it as a foundation of what will become their professional skyscraper with each new job and each new career adding a new floor in that professional skyscraper. That's a nice analogy. I can second that. So, Mark, what about life experiences? What in your own experience outside the classroom do you think are the most useful ones for someone to have who might want to build a career as a pop culture archaeologist? Well, again, reading, which is imperative for any profession, in my opinion. And reading is up to you. As long as you're reading and absorbing something beyond yourself, it doesn't matter from, in my opinion, what kind of material it is. It can be nonfiction, fiction, it can be comic books, it can be magazines, it can be the news or the newspaper, whatever it is, as long as you're constantly feeding your brain, that is hugely important to succeed in anything as far as I'm concerned. I also think it's important to interact with other people live. So as a writer, we tend to be reclusive, including myself at times, but it is certainly good to maintain friendships and a social life. In a way, it's a form of reading. It's a way of, it's a form of exposing yourself to ideas and cultures and things in the world that you might otherwise not know about. That is what sparks curiosity. And everything I do starts with curiosity, you know, wanting to find out more about something. So feeding yourself with people and people's words is critical. And For those who do go on Noble Mania, you will see that Mark's curiosity has taken him in so many cool directions. If there are any fans out there of MTV videos going back to the 1980s, Mark has a whole series on the girl in the video. And it is just fascinating how he has dug into who these women, who these girls are in these videos. So curiosity, a hundred percent. What, Mark, is the best part for you of being in a profession that you've created? Well, I fully believe that whenever possible, we should choose a job that we like, if possible, one that we love, because obviously you spend a lot of your adult life working. So it's one thing to choose a job that will make you secure financially. But at the end of life, you might not look back and feel that was the most fulfilling. I always encourage young people to start early with whatever your passion is. And even younger than high school, you you can find ways to dabble in what your interest is to just build that foundation for a potential job once you're out of college. So there's no time limit on that. And I feel like if you start younger, you get used to things earlier. You get used to rejection, which is part of everyone's growing up and every adult's life. I mean, you get rejected from things at times. You don't get the client or you don't get a job or something that you try fails. It's imperative that we get conditioned for that young so that it's easier to handle when we're older. What is the best part for you of being in a profession that you created? Well, I mean, I'm writing the rules and I'm also my own boss, which for me works really well. It's not for everyone, but if I have a a desire to, to pursue something, I can find a way to make it happen for myself. I don't need to check with anybody else. So that freedom is really nice. It's also scary at times. You know, obviously being self-employed, you don't know what your income will be from month to month in most cases. But if you're diverse and persistent and diligent, then, you know, eventually you'll be fine. Absolutely. As somebody who's in the same boat now, I second that. <laughs> yes. So what is the part of your current job, Mark? that sucks the most? Well, you're everything at once. I mean, I wish I could be creative all day, but I also have to 
do invoicing and I have to arrange travel and I have to, if something goes wrong with my computer, I can't call IT. There is no IT. I have to, I have to figure it out myself. So these are all relatively minor issues. I'm not complaining, but you do have to factor all that in if you decide to work for yourself. In my case, literally by myself, I don't have an assistant or a team of any kind. It's just me. I have to build in time to do all those more mundane things. So again, I'd rather have that trade off, you know, get to be creative for a living, but have to do some of the nuts and bolts myself than not have that opportunity to be creative. So it's worth it for me. Wonderful. And again, I second that. If only we could just focus on the fun parts of our job and not have to deal with the administrative life would be great. You have already touched on, frankly, what I think is fantastic career advice about becoming, trying to become immune to rejection and to the nose and building that grit. But what is the best career advice, Mark, that you've ever gotten? That's a tough one. I don't know if it's the absolute best, but it's certainly something that stayed with me for more than 20 years. A colleague I had in the 90s at one point said to me, if you're feeling overwhelmed, just take the first thing off your stack, which in those days would would have been paper, but these days we could say, you know, look at the first thing in your inbox that you need to handle and then just handle that on its own. Don't think about the rest of what you have to do. It's just basically one step at a time. And it does actually help if you get overwhelmed to just remember that you can't do more than one thing at any one time anyway. So just focus on the one thing that you start with. And then when you're done, move on, but don't let the other things hang over you while you're working on that first thing. Excellent. So just get started. (laughs) Just take that first step. One thing. Great. So two final espresso shots. What movies, if any, or Hulu, Netflix, Amazon shows, or books, Mark, do you think accurately depict your profession? Wow. There is an Oscar winning movie called Spotlight, which came out about four years ago that I loved because it was one of the first movies I remembered that showed writing and research as adventure. There's been so many movies about writers. And some of them are great, but that movie really showed that it's not just sitting stiffly at a desk and typing. There's an exhilaration to it, to research and to finding out information that's been buried or, or forgotten about. So that movie is about a very serious topic about the Catholic Church and child molestation. That looks very heavy. But the research side of it, which was the main focus, was fascinating. So I loved that because I could point to that and say, this is how it feels for me is this thrill, which is not always easy to explain to people. Um, As far as books go, well, there's a book written by William Goldman, who was a very successful screenwriter, particularly in the 70s. He wrote Chinatown and I think Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. And he wrote a book called Adventures in the Screen Trade, which I read in college. And it was a really helpful book for people that were going to enter any creative field because his mantra was nobody knows anything. Basically, if someone rejects you or says that what you did is not good, that's his or her opinion. It's not the world's final word on your work. So it's very helpful to remember that when you do get rejected, because one rejection is not the end of the line. There's still many other people in most cases that you can pitch something to. So I still think about that as well. And that, again, goes back 25, 30 years for me. That one three word phrase, nobody knows anything, really helps make me turn negatives into positives. Oh, that is fantastic. And we'll make sure to include them in show notes. And frankly, I have to make a plug for the documentary Batman and Bill, which is about Mark's journey as he investigated and researched and wrote Bill the Boy Wonder, the secret co-creator of Batman, which is just fantastic and has that exhilaration. And you feel like you are on a great adventure because you are with Mark as he gets to the bottom of his research. And I don't want to give away at the end of the documentary. Final espresso shot. What would Java junkies be surprised to learn about your profession, Mark? Well, it does involve more travel than I ever anticipated. Well, considering I anticipated that it would involve zero travel, (laughs) but that's if you choose to do that. So it would come into play in a couple of ways. One is research, of course, if you have the means to travel somewhere that you would like to do primary research, whether it's a library in another city or an ancient ruins. I mean, it depends on what you're researching. But also, if you 
are a storyteller in any form, I have found it to be very fulfilling and also helpful to speak. And, you know, not every writer likes that. Not everyone is comfortable in front of an audience. But for me, I, I love it. And so that is a way to not get, I don't want to say complacent, but just to, you know, not to get sedentary sitting at a desk all day. And also, it really, I think, keeps people on their toes, creative people, if you do go out there and, and see how you tell your story live. It does help, you know, polish you as a storyteller. And it also helps you stay connected to your audience so that you don't lose touch of who you're writing for, what they might be interested in, or what's style or approach or how you want to tell a story to a certain group of people. So getting out there and speaking to people for me has been really one of the best parts of my job. Well, it comes through. Having been in the audience when you speak, Mark's unbelievably charismatic. He's a phenomenal storyteller. And boy, does he have an incredible story to tell with Bill the Boy Wonder, the secret co-creator of Batman. Mark is the author of 75 books for kids and young adults. You can also read about his adventures in publishing at Noble Mania. And if you want to learn more about what Mark does as a pop culture archaeologist and how he built his fascinating career, please check out the show notes for this episode to see if Mark's main T4C episode, his interview, has already dropped. Mark, thank you so much. This was wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for being so complimentary and being so thorough with my work. You've described it better than most people that do this that I've met. So thank you. Thanks so much for listening to this latest episode of T4C. And if you're interested in learning more about my coaching services for confused college students and recent grads, feel free to check out the Time for Coffee website under the coaching tab at time, the number four, coffee.org or text me at 202-236-5712. That's 202-236-5712. Thank you.